you know, music to me is, um, it's the air that I breathe, you know, it's the blood that pumps through my veins that keeps me alive. So without it, I don't know what I, I don't know what I would do. I mean, I probably have a job or something like that, but people ask me, what would you do if you didn't have Green Day? And I said, what, I, I'd be in Green Day. I don't really know anything else. Or people say, you know, what do you think of people that only talk to you or like you because you're in Green Day? And, you, and I say, well, I am Green Day. That is me. That is my life.
Welcome to the Green Day World Tour 2005! I think to do something that you feel in your heart that's great, you need to make a lot of mistakes to get there. Anything that's, I think, is successful is a series of mistakes. With American Idiot, I mean, it started off with uh, having band practices, and uh, we, we came back and we, we started getting back into band practice down in uh, Billy's basement and stuff. And after, you know, literally after two or three weeks, we were just like, this sucks. We know how to have band practice. This is not how we want to approach making a record. Um, it, I mean, even to the point where Billy called me at one point and was like, do you even want to do this anymore? American Idiot was sort of a whole new, let's take on the planet sort of vibe. You should do it at least once in your lifetime. It, I think we were kind of scared, like when we were doing demos. and. But I think that there was some point that, like, you know, fuck it. If people fucking hang us, then fuck it. From day one of the record, I mean, the first thing we did, everything was about setting the goals of this record. You know, American Idiot, after recording it, we knew we had accomplished something that was completely above anything else we'd ever done. As soon as we wrote American Idiot, we kind of looked at each other like, this is this is better. We set that bar and, and then we sort of looked at ourselves like, okay, now we have a mountain to climb. I write a lot of songs when I'm going on walks and I was kind of thinking like, who is the American idiot? What is this person? Who is that guy? What kind of character is going to come out of that? Who is it? And I just remember going on this walk and then thinking, I'm the son of rage and love, Jesus of suburbia. I mean, those two lines right there for me were, oh my God, here we go. It was opening up something that not only was completely a, a new thing, but there was something about it that dug up some past, like, demons that, that you seemed like you closed off a long time ago, but you never reconciled with. And then those two lines came out, and it was, they were excited me and scared the living piss out of me at the same time. Every single line that you write, you hang on every single word, and you hang on every single moment. And for Jesus of Suburbia, when people are singing it back to you, they don't, they're not just reflecting what you've, what, uh, the, the things about the song that, are, that, that you're wrapped up in, but it's also the way their lives are wrapped up in it too. It's too much of an emotional moment. It's, it, it's one of the most emotional moments in a song I've ever written. That's the only way you can look at a song like that. It's like you can't sit here and look at it and say, oh, this is a catchy number. This is, you know, oh, God, I love to dance to this song. For a song like Jesus of Suburbia, there's too much emotion at stake to just simply say it like that. You, can, you don't even have to say you love that song. I don't even think that's a way to describe it. It's not about, it's, it's, it's about, it's about all the emotional baggage that you, you come with and that you are, are just, you finally have an outlet for. That's what, that, what Jesus of Suburbia is to me. And when it's reflected back at you by 65,000 people, it's, um, I don't know, it's a feeling you can't even describe.